Um, but good morning, everyone. Welcome to our June First Friday webinar. Um, today we have Kurt Hoplila here from Malum Architects um, talking about the transformative power of renovations, um, breathing new life into older facilities. Um, so before I turn it over, um, I just have a couple of reminders. Um, please feel free to type any questions that you have into the chat box. Um, I'll help kind of moderate that Q&A once we get to the end of the actual presentation. Um, and then also as we get toward the end, we'll post the link for the feedback form. Um, please make sure you do that as you're logging off, um, just so we know kind of how to continue this series um, and continue to meet all of y'all's needs. Um, in addition, if you have a presentation that you'd like to give for a First Friday webinar, um, we would be happy to discuss that with you and bring you on for one of our um, First Fridays here in the next couple months. Um, so just go ahead and shoot an email to the professional development email if you're interested. Um, and as always, um, this will be posted on the YouTube channel afterward. Um, and so you can always go back and find it there, um, as well as any kind of relevant links. And so with that, I will say thank you and go ahead and turn it over to Kurt. All right. Thank you, Becca. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to connect um, with um, what I consider to be my peers in, in the organization. I know I'm a corporate um, individual, uh, but with um, over well, we're approaching 15 years of um, collaboration with Northwest Tukuho. It feels like home, and so I, I know many of you, and um, just appreciate the opportunity to come and, and share. Um, this presentation was actually at the, um, the conference, and I just, you know, I emailed Bob and I said, hey, I'm willing to share this again. You know, we all go to sessions at conferences, and we all miss opportunities to see the sessions we didn't choose, and so felt like a good idea to um, dust it back off, so here we are. So I'm going to move through the content, um, and I'm glad you're, you're tracking any questions so that um, uh, at the end I can shut this down and we can see each other again and I can hopefully answer some questions. So I'm going to move with some, um, some cadence through this. Uh, I wanted to talk first and foremost with um, common issues that, uh, with existing housing, and some of that's going to be preaching to the choir because you're all going to go, yep, <laughs> I got that, I got that. Uh, and then tell the stories of uh, three specific projects and um, some of the key um, key ideas that helped uh, to create the transformation and then maybe follow up with uh, what we what we are learning and, and then uh, dive into some questions. So uh, as Becca mentioned, Kurt Hoplum with Malum Architects. Um, I've been uh, really focusing my career in, on residential communities for uh, most most of my career now and, and, and um, really helping to transform students' lives through empowerment and focusing on their, their unique needs and um, helping them thrive. Um, we really do focus on empowerment as a, as a mission with the firm and um, seek that in our work uh, to be much more intentional in the way we listen with empathy and with care and hopefully the stories that we hear impact the communities we design and, and really um, help, as I mentioned, help the students thrive. So let's talk about some of these common issues with renovations or with existing structures. Um, and they really fall into some big buckets, um, just the age of the infrastructure, um, the true barriers to promote um, equitable access for everyone, safety and security, and, uh, lack of um, basic amenities, which might be running water, as well as uh, I don't have a lounge. And then just talk a little bit about this idea that newer has, is better. So. When we engage with students, when we engage with um, your, yourselves and your peers when we're working on a project, these are the things that we constantly hear, constantly. Hey, sharing bathrooms, it's too loud, acoustics are terrible, um, low water pressure, it's ugly, looks like a prison, right? This is, this is uh, co constant themes that we hear as designers. And um, more specifically, uh, just looking at um, some of the projects, um, some of the things we've heard, spe uh, heard specifically is a radiator broke, leaked all over my room and all over my stuff. Um, <laughs> hate sharing your bathroom with 10 people. Um, it's old and the rooms are small, cold showers, no internet connection. You know, you, you hear it. And, and here's some great, uh, here's some great images from that. And I could, um, I, I can tell you that upper right, that was, um, this very odd toilet that I found at the bot in the, the basement of Duncan Dunn. Um, the one lower left, those are some classically old urinals from uh, Bean Hall down at U of O. 
And so these are the conditions that we come across, um, lack of privacy, a lack of um, cleanliness maybe even, um, it just not the kind of um, facilities you want to provide your students. And then more infrastructure related, um, the systems are shot. Um, this, uh, the, the, my hand is holding two pipes. The corrosion that you see is from uh, the college in at uh, Oregon State uh, many, many years ago that we renovated, um, where even down here where metal studs have literally rusted away and the only thing holding the shower together is the drywall. And we, we see these things. Here's a couple of classic images. One uh, on your left is what the college in used to look like previous to our renovation. And, and on the right, this is at Evergreen State College. So you can see that there's a um, barrier to um, community spaces for, for students with uh, different mobility challenges. Uh, and then just the dated nature of some of this. I, I love that old light fixture in this hippy dippy um, love pit fireplace thing that was designed in. I don't know what the architects were thinking back in the 40s, but um, not really pleasant experiences for students. Uh, similarly, the corridor is a place of constant um, um, groaning. Um, they're too small. They're dark. They, they, and, and so much life exists in the corridor. We know this. And so when this is your front door, um, not a very pleasant experience. No wonder people don't want to live here. And the word gets out. Um, uh, here again, the college in, I think about safety and security. This is a dark, uninviting um, entry. Imagine coming home from class at, at uh, in, you know, in the fall and it's dark. This, this is, and these bushes are overgrown. This is not a safe place. Um, over to your lower right, uh, not only is it an unattractive and uninviting uh, entry, but it is, um, there's all sorts of trip hazards and a lack of um, accessibility. So we want to pay, we pay attention to that. And then, you know, these are just, some sad social spaces. <laughs> um, I hope everyone's laughing um, because you, you do have these facilities that you're making the best of with this bomb proof like uh, furniture that was built for sturdiness for a gorilla but not for comfort. Um, uh, poor, uh, small technologies, uh, cramped kitchens, uh, the laundry facility that's in the basement and smells like the snuggle fabric softener, you know, outdoor spaces that are tired and worn. Um, this is what we see, this is what you see, and then our students don't have, uh, they don't treat it with respect, they don't treat it with pride. Uh, this is what happens in these, um, these common areas because um, it, it feels like no one cares, and that's not true at all, right? We know that. This is a little bit of a, a joke. If you lived here, you'd be home. Um, this, is not the, this is not the image that any of you want to um, project um, to your communities, to your parents of selective stu uh, prospective students. And so um, brand new, shiny, beautiful residence hall. And I love these uh, images. Uh, that's what everyone holds um, the dream of. This is what we should be doing, um, creating this amazing new facility. This is one in Copenhagen. Um, uh, I, I love them too, but I don't think this is the only answer. In fact, it's only an answer when uh, it makes sense. So we really tend to um, think deeply about the renovation and the transformative power. And so I wanted to share with you some of those stories. Um, so uh, a few years ago, we were uh, hired to not only, well, actually to start with the residential master plan uh, at Washington State University and the Pullman campus. And, and they have a very large residential inventory, not only first year uh, experience, but also apartments. And so the master plan led to the first phase, which was essentially um, to renovate two of their historic residence halls, Duncan Dunn and Community. Uh, and so the theme here is one of location. Uh, the, the beginning of both of these uh, historic residence halls were uh, in the 20s, um, both uh, uh, smaller in scale, freshman year experience, or rather we could say they were traditional dormitories. Um, FYE means something to all of us now that is different from just saying a traditional experience. Um, it was or originally a women's hall as well. Uh, the architect is Rudolph Weaver, which may, may be of no interest to anybody in this room. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, Duncan Dunn similarly um, built a few years after community. Um, it was a men's hall, so these were segregated as well uh, in, the, in, the, in the 20s, and that makes sense. Um, we found this factoid from the archives at Washington State. The building cost $150,000. Well, that's someone's college tuition now, not an entire building. Um, those are always fun 
but um, you know, that was a few years ago. The renovation, um, which is really joining these two residence halls, uh, costs quite a bit more, as you can see, uh, $21.8 million. Um, and we, we, we've completed this in 2012. So even this project is uh, nearing a decade old uh, in terms of its, um, its transformation. But so let's talk about that. As I mentioned, we started with this master planning. And I have to tell you, when we entered into this conversation, many, many of the leadership at Washington State wanted to tear all of the historic halls down. Why do they want to do this? They wanted to do it because they were tired. The systems were shot. They were seismically, uh, um, one could say, unsafe, or they weren't upgraded. Students didn't really like them that much. Um, well, I take that back. There were um, the amenities and the small rooms. There were elements of these facilities that people, uh, the students didn't like. And so um, that was kind of the conversational starting point of the master plan. But as we started to listen to our, do our outreach and listen to students, listen to um, deeper and more deeply to the voices, we did start to hear something interesting. Um, but we also looked at the buildings from a, from a, a technical assessment standpoint. And here you can see um, all of the apartments on the, all of the residence halls and how they scored in terms of their, their rating system for um, uh, modernization or renovation. And um, the lowest score equals the highest need. And you can see our two friends, Duncan Dunn and Community, scored pretty low. Um, so we recognize from a technical standpoint, from an infrastructure standpoint, we, these buildings had uh, needed some help. So there's a younger version of me uh, engaged in some, you know, you can see the wall is just peppered with uh, the different thoughts and ideas around how we would structure renovations, how we would structure um, new construction. Um, but the legacy conversations were, I think, what, what was most impactful to me uh, because there is a rich history uh, of these facilities. Uh, here are some uh, images from um, the archives just showing, um, I think this is uh, Wilmer Davis um, or Wilmer or Davis, I, I'm not sure which one, but the notion that these, there were generations of students that came before living in these, uh, these communities. And when we talked to the students, we not only heard that my grandmother attended um, Washington State and lived in this residence hall, or my mother, or my aunt. Um, but then, but there was this, you know, popularity around the historic architecture, which I think everyone, in some ways, um, has a, a romantic um, association with historic buildings. They're rich and contextual and, and, and beautiful and ornate. Um, but also living on the hill. What, if you're not familiar with uh, Pullman, it's a very uh, hilly uh, campus, and these historic residence halls were on the same level with the heart of campus. And so it was not only convenient, but easy to walk to the center of campus. So there was this idea that the location and the legacy, not only of the architecture, but of the people that came before, were possibly more powerful than the, 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 the um, desire to tear it down. And so the ultimate proposal was to save uh, the Hill Halls, uh, Stevens, Honors, McCroskey, Wilmer Davis, stuck in the community. And so as we moved forward with the assignment of renovating these two residence halls, what became clear was that uh, um, if we could connect these communities, we would have a richer and more successful um, overall student experience. Because while there were amenities in each building, um, there was uh, a greater desire to connect as a campus, as a you know, as um, members of the university, and so um, the the idea came to us to connect these buildings to, which would do a number of things for us. Certainly, connect students on a larger scale, um, provide a vehicle for accessibility to uh, install elevators, to promote universal access and to create more common space um, in different sizes and scales, which is something that Malin believes in uh, from a strategy. So we went from a tired old, uh, you know, torn carpet, uh, dingy uh, parlor to, to something that's got a lot of life, um, is modern, um, contextual, and is a great place for students to engage. This uh, is, an, is the alley. It was the old place where dumpsters and kind of the back of house of the two residence halls were actually staring at um, Duncan Dunn community, excuse me, uh, Wilmer Davis, but to, um, to the left is 
uh, Duncan Dunn, and to your right is community. But the idea of removing something completely functional and transforming it into something that's a student um, amenity, a student asset, was uh, kind of the big aha moment for this project. And um, so just the, the idea of taking that and turning it into this um, is, is really powerful. And I know that there have been new traditions started in this uh, this area. This is an enclosed space uh, protected from the Palouse winds, which can be quite fierce. And so there are dances and there are community gatherings that happen in this in this space. And it's really a rich and inviting place for students. So, um, you know, that, that's the story around com connecting communities. That's the story around legacy. And those are important considerations, I think, in any any um, renovation or any any new project for that matter. Now let's head on down south to San Diego, and um, I wanted to tell you a story about uh, a slightly more recent project that um, embraced other elements uh, in an existing facility to trans transform it into something quite quite amazing. So, Zura Hall, uh, you can see the, the historic photograph in the background there, and a few of the historic cars. It's built in 1968. Actually, just to date myself, that's the year I was born. Um, a fairly large concrete uh, nine-story facility cost three million um, back in 1968. It had a skip-stop elevator, so what that means is that the elevator stopped at every other floor, and I believe that was from a, a, a gender segregation standpoint. Uh, though, <laughs> for for whatever it's worth, I think the women's floors were where the elevator entered, and the men had to walk up the stairs. I guess. Um, but it was the first co-educational dormitory on campus, and yet it was still at least segregated by floors. And that was then, and it is today, necessarily. So when we entered this project, the overriding theme that we heard is um, the nickname for uh, Zura Hall was the Zura Zoo. It was a terrible place to live, and you can see some of the Reddit comments here. There was a, a ghost that haunted the halls, which is uh, wonderful and, and scary and hilarious all at the same time. Used to get chills when I was the only one on my floor. I heard so many stories about Zura that I don't, don't know what to believe. Um, uh, Zura, AKA the zoo, doesn't look appealing. Um, so there was this, uh, there wasn't a sense that everyone wanted to tear it down, but it was the worst place to live at San Diego State. Everybody knew it. And I think um, uh, <laughs> run, get out while you still can, save yourself. Uh, I think, that, I guess that. I believe that's a uh, Lord of the Rings reference, but uh, nonetheless, no one wanted to be there. So the refresh that was called in 2015 was a transformative um, renovation, cost 53 million, um, uh, and uh, actually increased the bed count a little bit. And uh, but that's not the interesting story. Um, where we entered the project was clearly a need to um, elevate the conversations around uh, equity, diversity, and, and frankly, e inclusion, EDI. Um, not only because of the glaring um, problem with the elevator, but um, the, this place was not conducive um, for communities. Um, within each residential community, there was this stairwell that I guess connected the two communities, but clearly, if you are someone with a mobility difference, this isn't available to you. Um, dark, uh, uh, narrow halls, all of the ingredients of a tired, worn residential community. So when we um, really took a look at the community programming, we made it, it's a code requirement, but we, we, we distributed um, accessible units of each type and distributed it in a way that, that promoted uh, students that wanted to be a part of the community and not just rely on a convenient access to the elevator. And yet we did provide some of the units that are closer to the um, vertical um, circulation system. Another thing we did was we made sure that when we renovated the, in, uh, the, the, the units themselves, we um, made sure they were fully accessible, that one could um, to pull up and charge a mobility device that was out of the way um, and just really were thoughtful about um, inviting um, students with um, mobility differences into um, the communities. Another thing was uh, thinking about gender equity, uh, gender diversity, that we did the best we could within the existing concrete infrastructure to, to, to promote equity. Certainly there's the single unisex restroom that is for all genders, um, 
safe, secure, and lockable uh, front and center. But um, you'll notice we still have gender binary restrooms. That was kind of hard to get away from, but we brought the lavatory and the, um, and the sink environment into a community, into a collective. It's open to the corridor so that um, we can uh, broaden the notion of, of community, extend that community, um, and that has turned out to be a really successful move. And it was the best we could do because every one of these walls that you see are concrete. And so that was, <clears throat> we were really limited but I think we made the best moves that we could. So from um, an environment like this, we transformed it to one that looks like this, that is uh, got open inviting uh, seating that is um, visually accessible, uh, that is uh, um, diverse. There was a roof deck that was screaming uh, as an opportunity to transform it into a place um, for all students to gather, to, to linger, there's an outdoor kitchen here. Now, this is San Diego. Um, you may not have this ability in uh, Alberta or uh, Pullman or um, Bellingham, but suffice to say, uh, we took advantage of um, an amazing climate. Uh, and the elevators themselves were upgraded, renovated, but also we provided these study carrels that were accessible and adjacent to the elevator. So we're promoting visual connectivity as a community as well. And of, of course, highly utilized places to study and hang out to see and be seen. So the story didn't necessarily end there. Um, you know, the before and after I think is, is dramatic um, just because we, as architects and designers, added uh, paint and, and, a, and, a, and an entry that was uh, celebrated. And, you know, we love to do that too. But, um, when I first got to this project, I noticed something peculiar for a Midwestern, or well, a Midwesterner moved to the Pacific Northwest. What are these wetsuits doing up here? Well, okay, I asked the question, and you know, these are wetsuits that the students uh, hang out to dry after they're done with the day's surfing. They take them into their their um, uh, uh, their showers and hose off their their boards and hose off their suits and lay them out to dry. And I thought, hmm. Salt and sand getting into plumbing, that's not a good recipe. And can't we do better? Can't we create a place? So I actually talked to some students and I said, wouldn't it be great if you had a location to deal with your equipment? Uh, and they said, yeah, that'd be great, dude. I don't know if they said dude, but um, San Diego has a legacy of um, a surf culture, um, bright and vibrant um, backdrop of the Pacific Ocean and um, surfboards themselves and uh, the characters and the personalities that are surfing, it's all rich and di uh, dynamic. And so not only were we trying to solve a functional problem, but we started to embrace the idea of the San Diego lifestyle because we heard so many people come to San Diego as a destination for, for their academic university experience because of the, the richness of, of what they have to offer. So we designed and built some, um, some surf lockers. So this locker is uh, long enough to, hose, to house um, a couple of short boards, your, uh, your wetsuits, any other things that you have. And we provided a hose down area in the front of the, um, the entry so that you could care for your equipment and wash the sand and the salt into an appropriate location and not bring your surfboards up, damaging the walls and damaging the plumbing. Uh, and then we started to play with the rich brilliant colors of, of surfboards as our muse from an internal inter, interior design standpoint. So color of the board started to identify maybe some wayfinding, um, you know, you're in the red community or the green community or the blue community. And then as we learned more about the production of the surfboards, we started to recognize that um, they could become part of the art. They could become part of the cultural statement. Um, but we had a problem with the surfboards in that that's an incredibly toxic process to your typical surfboard that you're gonna buy in a store. It's very toxic to produce it. And as we investigated this, we learned that there's, a, um, there's an emerging sustainable surf manufacturing culture in San Diego. They are working with, um, well, uh, they're working with hemp, as a material, they're working with um, uh, FSC certified woods and um, they're actually converting broken surfboards and what 
is called upcycling and, re and essentially reusing old boards. And so it was really, really wonderful to, to learn all about this. And then we started to say, well, this is an educational opportunity to talk about sustainability in the context of surfing and, this, and the surf lifestyle. And so they became um, the art that is in all of the communities. So you can see here, these are recycled uh, San Diego newspapers. Um, uh, so the art and the creativity of these, these boards are just beautiful. Um, Rico, I, I got to meet and see, see the processes of um, Mark Sanchez. Um, they're the ones that are basically dumpster diving for the broken surfboards and they, they take them apart and strip them, put them back together and create these new beautiful ones. Uh, John Wagner, uh, he uses um, a sustainably harvested wood. And then Kai Manu, he's using, um, I think, uh, different cork and hemp products in his processes as well. And then we got connected with Andy Davis, who's a very famous local muralist, and uh, commissioned him to, to do the mural at the front door. And so uh, here, here is the front of Zero Hall with this beautiful mural that, again, is evoking a sense of lifestyle and, and, and breathing new life into what was this tired concrete hulk. And so uh, here again, it's a way to think creatively about a renovation and, and recognizing that you can do a lot um, certainly, we solved technical issues of mechanical and electrical, and we solved the accessibility issues, and we promoted equity and inclusion, but we really embraced that unique story of San Diego. How am I doing on time here? It looks like we're, we're doing good. We're doing good. So let's head up to Eugene, Oregon, and talk about uh, the last story that I wanted to share, which was the, the Bean Hall renovation. And the theme that I wanted to share was about uh, metrics and measuring. And so... Um, Bean Hall <clears throat> was built in 1963, similarly a, a traditional style residence hall, um, a pretty big facility, uh, 730 beds even for its time. And it was, it, it's organized in two donuts with a, which, with the commissary down the middle. And, and I can only imagine that these were segregated uh, men and women on either side of the donut and everyone came together in the commissary or cafeteria. Contextually, you can see the Matthew Knight Arena, Hayward Field, um, to, to orient you to where you are on campus. This is in the East uh, Campus area. And in typical fashion, <clears throat> when we entered the, the, the building and really started to get down to the task of assessing um, dark, unattractive corridors, looks like they had upgraded the carpet somewhere down the line, but um, you know, the brick and, and the, the lighting was just not at all um, inviting the bathrooms. Um, dark tile, uh, no privacy, uh, typical. Uh, the, the rooms were small. Actually, these lights, while you may have this association with one window, they were both quite uh, small. Uh, and then this was the lounge. This is in the basement. So this is all they had. Uh, it was pretty bleak. Um, so what we did just recently was to renovate this um, and playing into the, the theme um, of their living learning model, um, we were to integrate uh, their their academic li learning commons within this facility, and it was renamed. It was rebranded um, to uh, in, in honor of Ch Chief Justice Robert Bean, um, and he, he, it was already named after him. But Bean Hall started to carry with it negative connotations, and so by rename even the simple task of renaming it has risen in its um, stature and importance, and recognizing. Um, uh, the, the uh, Chief Justice in a, in a positive way. So I wanted to talk about carbon um, under the umbrella of sustainability. Um, I think U of O has a, a reputation, as, as many of your peer institutions um, and ones that you work at, uh, being really focused on uh, sustainability. And um, I wanted to talk about a, a pretty important element within that, uh, that uh, conversation of sustainability and carbon, talk about carbon. Carbon is the <clears throat> is the emission that is uh, is uh, cast into the atmosphere and um, is really the biggest enemy we have um, uh, promoting climate change. And we as designers um, feel like we and as a society we have to start stemming the tide of the business as usual for, of um, and, and start to turn down towards zero carbon emissions because the carbon is, is, is starting to um, contribute to global warming, 
or climate change. And as the planet increases in its temperature, we see it continued glaciers melting, which is gonna rise sea levels and it's gonna have catastrophic impacts on, <clears throat> on the planet society. Um, I, I'm sure you're all well versed in the impacts of climate change in our society. So this graph really starts to show you that we've got to turn the corner. We've got to start working to reduce our carbon emissions, hopefully by 2050, where we um, um, can avoid some of these peaks and uh, have a higher chance of uh, staying below the two degree um, uh, temperature rise on the planet. Now, carbon is a complex conversation and to break it down in a, in, in, in a way that will help address the next series of slides, there's embodied carbon. Everything in front of you, pick up the pen, uh, your sketchbook, the, um, the monitor, the plastic, all of it has a carbon uh, footprint because of the manufacture of that piece uh, of, of material. Now think about a building and the concrete and the steel and the windows and the carpet. There's an there's a embodied carbon to the manufacture, the transport, and the installation of those materials. And then there's also operational carbon, which is the energy that we use for air conditioning or for heating or to power our lights. Um, and we're going to um, we're going to focus today on the embodied carbon because in the in the kaleidoscope of carbon emissions, building materials make up 90 percent of that, um, that that carbon impact. And so we can do a lot towards reducing our operational carbon, and we can should continue to do it. But the construction of buildings has a massive impact, and so that's where, as an architect, as a designer. I have an obligation, our firm has an obligation to focus on carbon, uh, uh, reducing our carbon footprint um, for, the for our future. And why are renovations important? Well, you can see here that a typical um, carbon matrix for a large heavy building um, is, is a lot of it's tied up in the concrete foundations and the footings, the exterior materials, um, even light even new buildings that are small in scale still have a very large carbon footprint. But renovations, that embodied car that, that carbon investment has already been made. And so its, it's carbon footprint is, still exists, and we have to address that, but it's much smaller than new construction. So right out of the gate, you draw the conclusion that if you can renovate a building, you're already making a huge uh, commitment to reducing carbon emissions. So how, do, how can I show you that um, in, in a more, um, in a less technical way? So we have uh, technology at our disposal as designers to measure the carbon impact of what we do. And it's, it's the program is called Tally, and uh, we, we assess every brick, every window, every screw, every uh, lineal feet of caulking and carpet and paint and we can calculate the carbon footprint of our renovation. So what we did uh, is to calculate that for, for Justice Bean Hall. What was the carbon impact of that 160,800 square foot renovation? And let's compare that if we were to have knocked that building down and built a brand new hypothetical building of the same size, and it doesn't matter what it looks like. It's just to compare the carbon impact of a renovation versus a carbon impact of a new building. And here is graphically that representation. So Justice Bean Hall um, had an, a carbon footprint of 1,125 metric tons of CO2. That still sounds pretty big. And you can see the distribution of where that material is. It's still a very large chunk of it's in concrete um, openings and glazings and metalwork. But if we had knocked it down and built new, it would have been over 3,000 metric tons of CO2 that we would have um, uh, uh, spent, if you will, to build new. So it's a, it's a times three factor. And let's put that into some context for you. So this is a Google image of uh, Eugene, and the university is here, and you can see that little green dot. That is where Justice Bean, uh, the, the, um, the building sits in context. So the renovation. Um, requires an area in pink of 1,000, which is which is the area in pink, 1,149 acres of forest that would have to be sequestered for an entire year to um, to draw out the carbon in the atmosphere to pay to quote pay for the in carbon impact of that renovation. 
if, I hope that makes sense. Another way to look at it is it would, um, by renovating Justice Hall, Justice Bean, um, the carbon impact is equivalent to 239 passenger vehicles driven for an entire year, uh, 126,000 gallons of gas consumed, or 130 homes energy consumption for an entire year. So let's not kid ourselves. A renovation still has a carbon impact, but what if we built new? This is the impact. The entire pink zone is what you would be looking at. Almost 4,000 acres of forest would have to be sequestered to pay for the impact of that new building. So what I'm telling you is you've already reached that conclusion. Renovation good, new construction bad. When we think about the carbon impact, now we still all have to do better um, from a carbon standpoint, but renovations are, are significantly better for the environment because um, they take less uh, materiality to, to, to and, and the carbon input. Another thing we did with um, Bean Hall is we wanted to hear from the voices of the students um, before we renovated and after we renovated. We wanted to hear, um, did we move the needle? Um, did we create a better environment for students? And, and, and what does that look like? So, um, so before we started the renovation, we took some time and, and had a survey issued to the, to the, um, the residents uh, of Bean Hall. And then when we got done and after there was some time living in Justice Bean Hall, we asked the same questions. And the data is interesting here. Uh, no surprise, only a handful of students uh, responded to us in the beginning. Um, uh, they didn't care to respond to that survey. We had a much higher percentage. Um, uh, consistently, women were interested in sharing their, their, their uh, impressions of the living environment. So, you know, go women. Um, and you can see it was a four year, roughly a four year delta um, uh, of time before we could gather the data. So what did we, what did we ask? These are the questions. They centered around five categories. Uh, what is the sense of community? What's your overall satisfaction? What do you like most? Um, what's important to you? We, talk, we asked about affordability, we asked about safety, and we asked about the amenities. And um, this was the survey results um, completed in April of 2016. So what I see here um, is an okay level of satisfaction with being home. The amenities received more dissatisfied. Um, safety and afford or affordability were okay, but likelihood to recommend, oof, nobody was recommending you should live in Bean Hall. Compare that to our, our, our uh, recent data of just last January. Well, certainly satisfaction has gone through the roof, and um, certainly everyone feels that way when you get a new car, you love your new car, it smells good. Well, actually it's not good that it smells good because those are volatile organic compounds, but I digress. Um, but safety and the amenities really um, skyrocketed to very satisfied and likelihood to recommend jumped as well. So certainly if you're thinking about recruiting and reten retention, you want to see um, your students saying this is a great experience you want to be in being in justice bean hall and that's happening now and i feel very proud of that mm -hmm. and it wasn't just the building it was the academic um integration that u of o invested in as well um so a couple of the specific questions question 11 was are you satisfied with the amenities um general high satisfaction um are you satisfied with your room i think there was less extremely satisfied people and more mod more, more moderately satisfied now. I think part of the reason is we didn't make the rooms larger. They were still quite small, but they were at least upgraded with better furnishings, better finishes, better electrical lighting, um, and we did our best to enhance the, the openings um, for daylight and views. Question 15, do you feel safe? I feel proud of this as well. I think people feel a lot more safe in this in and around this facility and i think that's a huge issue on campuses i know i don't have to tell you all that and here are some of the you know some of the specific comments that students um put out there you know lounges in the kitchens lend them to more connected environment for almost all the faces passing by i either know them or recognize them man that is to me that's that is so important to hear uh, people are chill you know that's cool that's right sense of community um if someone doesn't know you, you can approach anyone and they will have a genuine conversation with you. I think that's what you're after as leaders in um, these residential communities as well. You're trying to make connections. 
You're trying to make sure that these students are seen, that, they're identi that they can identify with this community, and ultimately that they can thrive socially and academically. And, I, and, and we feel like we've made huge improvements here at Justice Bean Hall. So what went up? Satisfaction, amenity, likelihood, uh, the response rate. What was interesting to me, no change in satisfaction, was the sense of community. Now, I had gotten comments from April of 2016 that students found community eventually. And I think there's a misery loves company kind of thing going on in a lot of our uh, tired old uh, facilities. Um, and so that arguably could be a place where we need to invest more time and be more thoughtful about, well, how do we enhance that sense of community? But anyway, I wanted to sh just share the, this was another way we measured, um, we, we, we measured the voices of students and we measured carbon. And these were two arenas where we felt like we, we made, we had traction. So in conclusion, I think we're, we're going to have a good 15 minutes or, or so to follow up. Um, don't judge a book by its cover. I, I, I think a lot of times your leadership come to these facilities saying, tear it down. I'm tired of dealing with the building. The message there is do your assessment. Look at the building from an accessibility standpoint, from a community life standpoint, from a technical standpoint, yes, seismic in, in our region. Uh, look at the systems. You know, really make sure that you're not investing in a building that ultimately really should come down because sometimes the assessment does say it needs to go for whatever reason. And I think listening to the past, present, and the future, this goes back to Duncan Dunn and community, really listen intently to what you're hearing about the, the legacy or the history of the space. Listen to the students that are talking to you now and think about their, their younger uh, siblings or the next generation and can a renovation serve their needs in, well into the future. Certainly get creative, innovative, and inspired. That's not just hiring great architects or great designers, but as we come together as students, as um, housing administrators, as um, campus architects, as campus leaders, there are a lot of great ideas and they can come from any place. This uh, whole thing about Zura Hall started from a, responding to a technical issue that I saw, but it was the campus architect, a representative from the university that gave us permission to dive deeply into the culture and really embrace this whole surfboard thing. And if he hadn't said, go and do it, I think we, we might not have seen the story unfold the way it did. So good ideas can come from everywhere. And, and think about carbon. Um, think about the financial, uh, the capital investment and the carbon investment already made with existing facilities. Because if you believe in, you know, the climate change and you believe in supporting the future generations, your children, um, there's a certain responsibility we have to think about affordability and think about um, sustainability and carbon sequestration or carbon reducing carbon emissions um, can be um, uh, highly successful in a renovation. So with that, um, I've got, uh, I've been talking for about 40 minutes, um, would love to entertain questions. I'm going to shut this down so I can see people. I'm more than willing to go back to any slide struggles and you have already heard and you already know which ones are the most popular or the least popular residence halls and why. So oftentimes I serve as the, um, I think um, Bob Tattershaw, who Tiffany knows well and loves, he's a, he's a straight shooter. And, you know, he's like, Malin's just telling us what we already know. But it's having a third party independent person tell it to your leadership changes the game a little bit. Same with um, University of Wyoming. We did a large master plan for them. And the housing people, I was preaching, to, I was telling them everything they already knew, but it was the ability for someone outside of the university to say, hey, here's what I see, um, helped the, your leadership start to think differently. So I would encourage you guys to host those kind of tours so that they see it for themselves and, um, and listen to them and, and you know, try and bridge some of that gap. It wasn't a, a hard change when we started at Washington State. Um, there was just this opinion because they had recently renovated Honors College and it was really expensive and the, nothing really changed for the students, right? The systems all changed, but um, 
So they had that in the back of their mind, not going to do that again. But through our conversation with the students and these legacy conversations, we all turned to, we have to save these things. It's one of the things that draws people to Pullman, to Washington State. If you're choosing between the universities and you've got these gorgeous historic residence halls, um, UW doesn't have that. Um, Western Washington doesn't really have that. They have some, but so it was not turn, turn it into an asset, turn it into a recruitment tool. And I think that's what we're seeing. I ho hope you agree with me, Tiffany. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? I got a question there for you, Kurt. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on kind of how um how students like treat the environment after they've been the renovations have happened and so like you, you mentioned that before there's you know people might disrespect the property or disrespect the furniture has have you done any assessment on kind of how those like maintenance housekeeping issues how they've decreased after um kind of doing all of these upgrades and facelifts to make the the place more inviting and more kind of um I don't know, a little bit more ownership over yeah. what's been there? Uh, Bob, it's a great question. I have to confess, we haven't been able to like do some deep research into that, um, but I, I, I know it to be true. There is data out there, there is research out there that maybe more globally talks about an individual sense of pride of their place when the place is um, you know, uh, not, not uh, derelict. Um, architects uh, study Pruitt Igo, which is uh, some tenement houses um, that were in, uh, I think, in St. Louis. And there were a lot of that that um, critical research about design and um, a sense of pride and the, the beauty of the space was manifest in the way people treated and treated themselves and treated the buildings in that in that building. But I'm getting off on a more intellectual route. You know, when you have your own housing staff that they deeply believe they're connected to the students that they are not just there to clean the restrooms but they are there to serve the, the students and they become ambassadors of your messaging um I, I think you 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 get so much benefit out of that and um we do get into conversations about um fdes and cleaning um and has that changed dramatically and i just feel like you're giving me the it's the challenge that I need to dive into the, that. Because, I mean, we, we literally talk when we're designing about the time it takes to clean a shower versus to scrub a, a tub and times that by 100. And if I have to hire someone else, uh, we, we're not going to go there. So w we sometimes make operational or design decisions based on operational staff. And so we can get into that layer. I just haven't. And I think you're telling me I need to. I think it would help add a dimension to the why. Why would you do this? Yeah, I think it's. I think we know it's happening. It'd just be cool to see that 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 data or that changes. I mean, we added uh, like couches. Super simple example. Added couches at Mount Royal, and we, you know, there was initially kind of a worry that there would be damage to them, um, being in common spaces that weren't locked, and, and we haven't seen that at all. And I and I think it does come down to kind of this proudness or and pride that you know within the community. So right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you mentioned furniture, and you saw some of that that furniture that's like um, two by, built with two by fours, right? Um, they've been around since the 60s, but they're completely uncomfortable. And um, we have to strike a balance of durability, washability, cleanability, and aesthetics that they're, they're, they look cool, they look, and they're comfortable, they gotta be comfortable too. So um, furniture is an area where we, we, in some ways need to invest even more time with you to make sure we're making the smart choices on the operational side and on the student life side. And there's lots of good choices out there uh, that are wipeable, cleanable, and um, in, in our new world of COVID that may even impact um, how that looks um, different, um, but still focusing on um, wellness and uh, infection control. That may be a, a, you know, maybe we're merging some of our, just thinking out loud, some of our medical uh, furniture choices with some of our residential choices. I don't know, that's probably coming. But sorry to derail that. No, not derail at all. I think that's a really <laughs> relevant point that we're all probably going to be thinking about these next couple of months or years. 
So we've got a few more minutes left if there are any more questions. Um, I also did pop the feedback form into the chat. Um, if you can go ahead and take a look at that and fill that out before you're done. Um, yeah, any last questions? Yep. Um, if you, uh, let's see, I think, I don't know if I posted my my uh, LinkedIn or my uh, email, but we can certainly send that out. If you have any questions you want to just send me directly, more than happy to um, be a sounding board. Um, and we're, uh, as Bob knows, we're meeting kind of bi-weekly to just check in with each other and, and um, think about what the future looks like. Uh, it, it's a uh, I'll put a plug out for Kurt's virtual lounge. It's uh, I should probably get the email list here and get everyone on the invite list. It's, it's an opportunity for all of us to connect. Oftentimes we're just talking about what we are doing this weekend and we're not focused on our, our the good work, but oftentimes we do talk about um, how our current environment, our, our environment we're in is changing how we're approaching our work. Um, hopefully some sometimes some good ideas come up, hopefully as a reinsurance that you're not alone. Um, and I just appreciate seeing all your faces. Uh, uh, we probably all miss each other. You know, February can't come soon enough. Um, I don't know <laughs> where, where we're going to be, but um, uh, it's good to see everyone and appreciate your um, commitment to the organization and hanging out with me for an hour. Hopefully you learned something, but feel free to ask more questions. Yeah, thank you, Kurt, again so much. Um, and I did pop his email in the chat as well, um, if anyone wants to kind of copy and paste that to use later. Um, so with that, it looks like we are done for our June First Friday webinar. Um, remember, this will be posted on the YouTube here in a few days, and so definitely recommend um, if there's anything you want to share with folks. Um, they can log in and watch later. Um, remember to fill out the eval and to send us an email if you're interested in presenting at a later time. That's about it. Thanks, everyone.